Hey guys, welcome back. This is part two of creating your own custom API in ODBS 2. If you've not watched the first part, the link will be in the description. In part one, we set up a Docker container to host our custom API. In part two, we will be adding a method to the API and testing it with Swagger. In part three, we will, we will be writing C++ code to allow our game project in Unreal Engine to connect to our custom API. Adding a method to our custom API. First, let's take a look at the anatomy of an API request. So we have the HTTP request coming in and the controller picks it up, binds the values to our model, and then our request object uh, does the processing, calls the repository, which then makes the database query call, and then the thing rolls backwards and returns the result uh, to the client. Now let's take a look at what that looks like in our Visual Studio project. So we're going to go to the Character Persistence API, and you'll notice that we have controllers and we have requests. And you'll notice that in the controllers, we have abilities, characters, and status, and those match the folders in the requests of abilities, characters, and status. Let's take a look at the add ability to character request. Okay, so, and now we're going to take a look at the controller and we're going to scroll down to add ability to character. It's right here. So first of all, this is a post. It's an HTTP post and the route is add ability to character. Now this controller at the top also has a route that's API forward slash the special controller value. The way that this works is that there's an automatic naming convention that the word in front of control controllers in the class name is matched to that. So the URL for this is going to be our domain name, forward slash API, forward slash abilities, and then forward slash the route on the individual method, which is add ability to character. It's going to produce a return type that is success and error message. It basically just has a bool that says whether it succeeded and an error message. Um, this is normally used when there isn't some specific value we're returning. Then, uh, because this is a post, we need to pull the data out of the post body. Um, that's a section of data that is in an HTTP post. And we're saying from body, and we're going to match that up to our add ability to character request. Now, there's an automatic uh, model binder that is going to create this object and match up all the values for us. But let's take a look at what those values are. So if we go to the definition, you'll see that there are four public values, uh, three strings and an integer. We have ability name, ability level, character name, and character has abilities custom JSON. The model, model binder is going to be looking for these values in our HTTP post data and is automatically going to match those up and fill them for us. The next line we have here is a bit odd. Uh, if you are familiar with creating APIs uh, in C Sharp, you are going to be very confused because normally this is handled by dependency injection automatically. But I did a lot of side-by-side -side testing, and what I found is that the performance improvement from sending these references directly rather than double injecting them was just too huge to ignore. If this were a business API, I would totally skip this, let the dependency injection handle it. Uh, but in this case, side-by-side -side testing showed that this was a huge performance improvement. This is a game API. We want to reach 100,000 plus concurrent players. Uh, so we're going to take the, take the performance game. It's an ugly line. Um, it's basically just taking these values, character repository and customer GUID that were injected into the controller and passing direct references to our request objects so that we don't have to double inject it and inject all the request objects into our DI container. And then the final line here is that we are going to call request handle. And if we go back over here, we can see that there was the set data that's just basically passing the references to those two things we needed, which was the characters repository and our customer GUID, which is pulling it off a special HTTP header. It's a piece of middleware. And then we have this handle that's doing the actual work, right? It's, it's taking the characters repository. It's calling add ability to character, sending those values that were bound. 
and then building a success, an error message object, and returning it. So this is the basic anatomy of an HTTP request, and we're going to follow this when we add our new API method. Now we need to plan out our API method. Let's call it update character strength and agility. So obviously we need to send strength and agility values, but we also need to identify the character we want to update. Also, because this is a public API, we need some kind of security measure to stop hackers from updating characters they don't own. Our security will be our user session GUID. Now there are two ways we could go about this. There is a system already in place in AWS to connect a single character with a user session using user session set selected character API. But right now, we don't set that value until the select character button is pressed right before connecting to a UE server. During character creation, we have not called that API yet. We could modify our game project to call user session set selected character early in the process as we navigate from character to character. If we did this, we could just send user session GUID strength and agility without sending the character name to update. But for this example, I think we will do it the longer way and include the character name. It might allow us more flexibility later, though it will require some more work up front. Because the AWS API allows an unlimited number of game projects in a single installation of AWS, we also need to send customer GUID, which is our API key. So the parameters we send to our update character strength and agility API will need to be customer GUID, user session GUID, character name, strength, and agility. We don't really need any kind of special return value because we're not getting data to return. So we're just going to return the success and error message output object that we looked at a little bit earlier. Let's start building our API. So we're going to use the uh, my character per, uh, ODS character persistence as a guide uh, to copy code from. And we're going to go up to my game public API and you'll see that it doesn't have a controllers folder and it doesn't have a request folder. So we're going to right click here. And we're going to say add new folder. So we're going to add controllers, which is a special named folder folder. And then we're going to add requests which is not a special name, it's just something I made up. And since we're updating, so it's a bit of a tough one here to decide. So in the ODBS public API, I had kind of made a decision that the user's controller was gonna be anything that had a user session GUID. Here, I kind of wanna call it, I kind of wanna call it character since we're updating a specific character but that would break the idea of everything with the user session good is the users. I think I'm going to go with my, I think I'm going to go with users um, because I had already decided that. So I'm going to add a new item. And let's see, actually, Come here. Yep. So we went to ASP.NET Core Web, and we're gonna add an empty. Hmm. That was a good question. I didn't check to see. Let me take a look here. So we'll go to this controller and take a look to see whether we were using API controllers. Yeah, we're using API controllers. Just want to make sure. For certain project, I use MVC controllers. Actually, we can just use this add controller. This is even better than doing it the other way. Um, API controller empty. And remember that the word in front of controller Yep, and we're using the plural, so it's not users, user, it's users. So users controller. It's going to add that for us. Yeah. And that correctly added what we needed there. And so now we're going to go to requests and because it's called users, we're going to add a folder for organizational purposes under this called users. And here 
we can just add a class. So on this one, we decided that it was going to be called, I'm going to copy and paste it, but we decided that it was going to be called update character strength and agility. And the convention is for us to add request. So we know it's a request object on the end. There we go. So now we've got our user's controller. We've got our request object. So we're going to come over to our characters. Let's go to our abilities controller. This is the one I'm going to copy. And this text here that you see, these comments, this is actually what powers the help system in Swagger. So we're going to, we're going to do that the right way and pull all that over. So I'm going to grab this code here from the abilities controller. It's the add ability to character. And I'm going to copy that over into users. And we'll start by filling out the swagger information. So updates the strength and agility of a character. I just do update because then that's just the summary there and here's the longer remarks. Updates the strength and agility of a character specified by character name. This we also require a valid user session to do it. And then here are the parameters that are being sent. And so we can actually fill these out. So we'll have customer GUID. And we'll say this is the API key. And then the next value was user session GUID. Is a valid user session GUID that contains the character name we need to update. Then we have character name. This is the name of the character to update. And then we have strength. Strength value to update. It already added the comment there. And now we're going to do agility. OK, so we've got our comments now in Swagger. It's going to look really nice when we go test it there. So now we want this to be a post. We need to post all these values. It's not a get. And the route is going to be, I'm copying it again. The route is going to be this. So this is going to be forward slash API, forward slash users, forward slash update character strength and agility. So that's going to be our URL when we need to test this. Success in error message. So there are certain usings up top here, and we don't have all the ones that are up top here. But there's a cool thing built in where if it sees something, we can just go to show potential fixes and say using, and it just adds the one we need at the top. And you can see that issue went away. I'm going to copy. OK, so produces success and error message. So that's the same thing. And we have task, async task. This just means that it runs asynchronously. And it, we're going to return a success and error message. So that's good, too. So now we're going to copy this name to the name of the method. We're going to say from body. And remember, we already have this request object. So we're going to come grab this and put that here. And it's not going to know where it's at. So we're, again, going to hover over it, show potential fixes using, it added the using my game public API request users namespace. And we're good there. So now what we need to do is we need to build out this request object because it's looking for set data and it's looking for handle, and they're not there. So what we can do, this is what I usually do, is I just come and copy an existing one. So we're going to copy this. 
and we're going to paste it into here. Obviously, it's not all correct. Some of the things might be the same, some might not. And it's also going to have the same issue where certain values here are going to not be in the using. So we're going to go through, have it add those. This is where we get this header custom GUID. This is where we get our API key from the uh, from a, a HTTP header. It doesn't come in on every post. It comes from the HTTP header. Um, we're not going to use this add ability. We're going to we're going to build this out later. But for now, let's focus on getting these input parameters. So remember the model binder here. This from body is going to look at the incoming values in the post, and it's going to look at the list of public values here, and try to match them up. So we need to get those all set up. Now the customer GUID is actually not going to be passed in because it picks it up right here. So we're able to not do that one. But we do need to start with user session GUID. This again here is for Swagger. So this is going to build out the nice, uh, the nice help as we're testing it. This, and we can even come back here and we can copy these same, same descriptions. Okay. The next one was character name. It is going to be type string. Oop. I want the lowercase one, not the uppercase one. Is that our character name? We'll come back over here and copy the text. So this is just a format here. It's actually being output into an XML document. It's part of something built into the documenting system in Visual Studio. And then Swagger is able to pick up that XML document. If you look at our startup CS, uh, right here, my game public API XML. This is being output from from these comments in this format into this XML file here, my game public API XML, and then that's going to be picked up. Um, let us make sure. I think we did this last time, and I'm going to make sure that it is being output. It is right there. See, my game public API XML in the XML documentation file. So that's all connected, and we'll be able to see that when we go to test it. Okay, character name. The next value is strength. Now this is where we're gonna have to make an interesting an interesting decision. So the database is storing strength and agility as floats. The game playability system in UE in Unreal Engine is also using floats. But most of the time you don't send strength of 12.25, you know, or something like that. You usually send integers. So we could do it both ways here. We could stick with the float, which is what the database and, and the others using, or we could convert to integers in between. It's a tough choice. I think rather than having to deal with data conversion right now, I'm, I'm going to stick with float. Um, but you may decide to use to use integers just to normalize the values and make sure that you can't get any weird decimal values going into the database. Okay, and I need to do those comments. So I guess it's a little confusing the way these are spaced out because anyway, it's for the one below it. We could potentially space them out differently. And this one is agility. Okay, so now user session GUID, character name, strength, and agility are being matched up right here from this request body. And we don't have to do the customer good because it's being picked up by this middleware that's pulling it off the HTTP header. Um, so this set data should 
Ash exclaiming maximal comment. Uh, that should be good here that we're sending a character repository. Um, doesn't exist in the current context. Okay, so this, this is an issue here. These values have not been filled from the dependency injection system. So let's go over to characters controller and you'll notice that we have private read-only references at the top here to store references to those systems. And then we have a constructor that picks them up from the dependency injection system and that has to be named the same name as the class. And the same issue here, we need to make sure there's using statements. I'm just hovering over adding these. Now, when this user controller, again, it's just complaining about the XML comment. When this user controller is instantiated, it will automatically go to the dependency injection system and say, hey, I need an I characters repository. I need an I header customer good. It will find the correct ones that have been wired up in startup, match them to it, fill the references, and then they'll be available down here to send on set data. And that gets them into this system here and sets private references here so that we can use them in our handler. So the next thing that we need to do is we need to build our handler to actually do the work. We've done all the setup, we're ready to do the work. Now we need to actually do the work. So let's think about what it is we need to do. So they're sending in a user session good. And that's our kind of our security token. And so we need to make sure that the character name is associated with that user session good, right? Because it wouldn't make any sense to let someone send in their user session good and send in someone else's character name, right? So we need to do that first. And we have a method already that does that, but it may not be in this character's repository. So let me show you where our data layer is. So there's a project called OWS Data. And this is where we have our models and our repositories and implementations. So we're using the MS SQL one for implementations, but we don't really need to look at that because that's just how did it do it? We are just interested in what is it doing? We don't have to know how. And so we've got our characters repository, instance management repository, instance launcher data repository, users repository, and zone server repository. Let's see if it's under users. It is, it's called get all characters. So you can send in an API key and a user session good, and you can get all the characters. Well, this will let us loop through the characters and make sure that they're updating a valid one, but it's in the user's repository. We don't have that. We have the characters repository, which we will need that later when we want to make an update. But let's add, also add the user's repository. So we're going to come here, we're going to copy this, and we're going to say users repository. And then we're going to need to connect it so that we can pull it in from the dependency injection container. You can see here that for parameters, we're using lowercase without the underscore. The underscore is telling us it's a private read only. These are just naming conventions from Microsoft. So I stick to them. So we're going to set up that reference. And now that will allow us to send the user repository in the set data. Now we need to modify the set data to pick that up in our request object. The easiest way is to come here and copy this. And then we need to make somewhere to store that. I'll show you something a little interesting here. It's a bit odd, but it's the standard Microsoft convention. So since it is private and not read only, it does not get the underscore. We can't set them to read only because read only means they have to be instantiated in the constructor. They're not, they're, in, they're set up in set data and set the value rather than setting the initial value in the constructor. And so now you have an interesting thing where you have user repository here and you have user repository here and they're both the same name. So how do we deal with that? What we do is that we use the keyword this. So what this does is it 
it has a system of order that it follows. And so when you just say user's repository, well, this is a user's repository, but it has this one here as a higher precedent. This one comes first, higher priority. This dot tells it, hey, I don't want the one from the method. I want the one from this, which is the object. So this user repository is pointing to this one. User repository here is pointing to this one. Anyway, it's the convention they use. Other programmers will name those names differently so as to not have to deal with using this, but this is the Microsoft convention, and so I'm following it. So now we have access to our user's repository, which allows us to call get all characters. And we need to send in our customer GUID, which we have right here and our user session good that we have right here. Now, what it's gonna tell us is this call is not awaited. So this is a part of the asynchronous programming that is what makes .NET Core insanely fast, but we have to put the word await. And so what that tells it to do is, normally if you didn't use the word await, it would call get all characters start another thread, start processing it on another thread and keep continuing, not waiting for it to come back. Await says, hey, start processing that, but I'm gonna wait here until you're done. I'm gonna wait until you return the value, which is important because we actually need the value. So we're gonna do VAR, which gives us a new variable. Um, and it's an, like an auto type. So whatever the type's returned, it'll be that type. And we're just going to say all characters. I'm gonna be overly wordy here just for example purposes, in the user session. Probably wouldn't normally do that, but just so we're really clear on what's, what we're getting. It's all characters in the user session. So then what that will allow us to do is after we get that, we can say for each, and we'll do var current character in, all characters in the user session. And now it's gonna loop through. And so then if we do this current character, we can pull out character name, okay? So what we can do here is we can set up a system where it looks to see does one of them match this character name. So the way I like to do that is by setting up a bool and we'll call it, did we find the character. And we start out by saying it's equal to false. And then what we do is we say, hey, if one of these matches, set it to true. And if it makes it looping through all of them and none of them ever match it, then it didn't find it. So then at the bottom of this, we can say, if did we find the character, and we're actually interested in, did we not find it, okay? So if we didn't find it, okay, then what we can do is we can return a new success and error message. And we could do success equals false, and error message equals Could not find the character name. Okay, so this is a bit of our security protocol here, right? So what would happen is if it loops through and it doesn't find it, it's going to hit this and come back say could not find the character name and it's not going to update it, right? So this is this is our security to stop someone from sending in because remember this is a public API. This is going to stop someone from sending in a user session good that does not contain the character name they're trying to update. So now we know if we made it past this if, that means it did match. Perfect. So we can come down here and we can use our character repository. And we can call update uh, character stat. Okay, and because we want to update that agility and strength. So let's go take a look 
at the characters repository and update character stats takes an update character stats and there are a ton of them here this is going to be a real pain the way this is set up but we're going to do it probably again this is just an example if it wasn't an example i might write a new data method that just updated the strength and the agility um, but we're going to use what we have so we need this update character stats object And again, we're gonna have to do that so that we can tell what it is. And this will now update the stats. We're gonna do an await. I don't think we're really interested on what it returns. So this underscore equals just, it's called a discard. Oh, it doesn't return anything anyway. Okay, cool. If it did return something, it'll make us discard it with that, um, but it didn't return anything, so it doesn't matter. So now the issue is that we have this update character stats and we can do this. We can say strength equals the strength from up here. And we can say agility equals agility, right? The problem is that this update character stats is going to start out with blank values for everything else. Okay, and it's not just going to update the values that we set. It's going to update all the other values and basically set everything to zero. So what we really need to do is we need to get the current values first, then change just the two we're interested in, and then we can do our update, which is a very common method in this type of system is that when you want to update a subset of something, you pull all of it, you update what you want to change, and you update it. Now, this is slower. This is slower, so keep that in mind but it's a lot less code, right? So there's two kind of schools of thought here. One is that every single update has its own custom query to the database to just update what's being updated. In this case, you would say update strength, update agility, right? And you're done. The, that method is faster. It is, it is faster, but you end up with a lot more code because now let's say you add this update strength and agility and another one updates another field, another one updates another field. You have all these different updates, queries that you need to maintain. The other method is that you just, every time you want to update a subset of something, you get all of it and just change what you need to change and then send the full update back to the database. So you're basically, you're getting away with it because you're updating the value of a ton of fields to the value they already were, thereby not changing anything. You can see that that's slower, um, but it's a lot less code to maintain. So let's see what we'd have to do to do that. I didn't completely think this part through before we started. So we have another one here called get character by character name. And so if we come here, we're going to end up with an ugly mapping equals weights and we'll use our character repository get character by character name and we've already verified that that character names in the session so it's considered a safe name We need to send a customer go it. That's fine. Okay. Here's the issue. <laughs> Normally what would happen in most of these kind of systems that work this way, this type that it returns would be the same type you send in for the update. And so you would just take the one object, set the two values and send it back in. That is not the way this is built because ODBS one that this came from is designed on the idea of doing individual updates as opposed to uh, full updates. And so this, this is something over time will probably work to get a little smoother. Whereas ideally this would just be character. This one would just be character. And we wouldn't have to do what we're gonna do here, which is a very ugly mapping. Let me show you what we have to do and I'll, I'll pause the video in between while we're typing all this, but basically what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to map every field from 
get character by character name to every field and update character stats. And I think there's around 70 of them. So what we would do is we would come here, probably do these in alphabetical order. And we're basically running through and matching these up, right? So you see what we're doing is we're taking the, oh, that's interesting. Ha! One of these was generated by uh, a system automatically that pulled them in from the database type. So we're actually also going to have to sit here and cast them all to float because what this is a double and this is a float. So kind of interesting that those two don't match. So we'll basically have to go through here and match up all 70 or so of these. Uh, Agility is actually one we want to skip because that one is being set above there. So we'll actually skip that one. And we'll copy alignment. I don't know. We'll have to look at the types of all these. Anyway, it's going to be fun. So you can see I got to go through and do that. I'll pause the video while I type up. This is probably going to take 15, 20 minutes. And, uh, and then I will be back. Okay, that was painful. It had me really thinking, maybe I should have just done a direct SQL update and not had to create this entire mapping. So uh, that, that was fun. Um, anyway, we are going to move on. So now we've let's walk through what we've got here. We're grabbing all of the characters from user session. We're making sure that the character name we want to update is one of those valid characters. Then we're getting the values from that character name. Strength and agility are purposefully not copied in this mapping because we're setting those to new values. And we go through, copy all the old values, and we say update character stats, and it goes through and updates all the stats, but most of them are being set to the value they already were, and so therefore there's no change, and the only change is in strength and agility. So I think we're at the point here where we want to test this and just see how it's working. Now we're not done. There is a key piece we're missing. Maybe, maybe you're thinking right now what it is, uh, but we're going to try this and see how it works. So we're going to hit the Docker Compose button. Hopefully it won't take too long to build this here. And uh, we're going to use Swagger to test this out. Now I've already uh, connected to the SQL database here and typed out a few queries to get them ready. Uh, so we'll take a look. Uh, it's already up. Cool. Okay, so we'll take a look here. So I wrote this query here to get the values from the character that we're interested in. And uh, and so these are the current the current values of the API key, the user GUID, the character name, and the strength and agility, which is what we're updating. We do not have a user session, right? Now we could go and connect Unreal Engine and log in, and then we'd get a user session, and we could pull that. But we're going to cheat here by just inserting a user session. Uh, and then we'll just grab it and, uh, and pull it out of there so that we have it. But let's go over to Chrome here. I'm going to refresh it. And you'll see here that we've got all that help language we entered in those comments. They all pull in here real nice. And so the cool thing here is that we can actually try it out. But before we can do that, we have to click this Authorize so that it has our X customer good, which is our API key. So we're going to go back over to SQL here. We're going to grab that customer good, which is the API key. And we're going to come back here. We're going to paste it in and hit authorize. Okay. You can see now it has lock icon and now we can try things out. So we're going to hit try it out. We need a user session good, a character name, strength, and agility. So I'm going to come back over here and here is, oh, it's our user good. We need a user session good. So we're going to come up here. We're going to insert into user sessions. We're going to copy the API key, the customer GUID on the first field. For user session good, we're going to do new ID. We're going to say generate us a new one. And then for user good, we're copying this user good value here. And the login date, we're just setting to a current date. So we're basically emulating a someone logging in without ending or even their password. Okay, we now have a user session good, so I'm going to copy that. I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to paste it in. And you remember that our character name is test and purposefully see if you can remember what we're doing wrong here. I'm going to purposefully set the strength to 99 and the agility to 99 like a real hacker. 
And one of the things I want to show you here is the fact that you can step through the code. So we're going to come back up here and we're going to drop a breakpoint right here by clicking over on the side on this handle. And then we'll come back here and we will hit execute. You can see this is flashing. It hit the breakpoint. So we can see the user session good it sent in, the customer good it sent in. We can see the strength at 99, the agility at 99. So it's easy for us to follow through. I hit F10. I can see that it pulled all the characters for the session. We can see test is in there. So now we run through this. It matched. So we're going to get past the security check. Fine. And now we're going to pull all the data for that character. Good. I don't want to F10 through all of those. So I'm going to actually come drop another breakpoint here. And then I'm going to hit continue. So it went through all these values, copied them all. And now we're taking that and we're sending it into the update character stats. I'm hitting F10. It successfully did it. We're setting success to true, error message to blank. I'm going to hit continue. And we have our return value. And we got success true, no error message. Okay, so now if we come back over to SQL, we can see that it set it to strength 99, agility 99. Do you see the problem? Yeah, we had a rule that said strength plus agility must equal 20. But we didn't code that. So let's go back to our code. We're going to hit stop. And we need to add another check here. And we could wait to do it until after, but one of the one of the kind of design principles that you try to do when you're verifying things is early out. You try to quickly find the things you can check the fastest to say, no, don't continue any further. And so in this case, we know that if anybody's sending in a strength and an agility that do not equal 20, they're a hacker because the client is going to verify those values before it sends it, right? And so we don't even want to let them hit the database to do this, get all characters. So even in front of that, we're going to write something here that says if strength plus agility does not equal 20 and we are going to return false and we're not going to give them too much information about this. Um, you don't want to give hackers more info than they need. We're just going to say invalid input values. So they don't really know what happened. They don't know, oh, the rule is they have to equal 20. We're we'll just saying invalid input out values. Okay. So now what we can do is we can run this again. And I'm going to put the breakpoint here. And we're going to start Docker Compose. And we're going to try doing that same thing with 99 and we're going to see that it will fail. And then we'll try it with some valid values to finish this out. So here's how you could create any set of rules you need. We could just start stacking these rules up on your input values. And since you're making this call from, uh, directly from the game client, it can't be protected. Right. And so we have to validate everything we send to any public API. On the private APIs, it's not as big a deal. People can't access them. Only the server can access them. You could add some rules if you wanted to, but it's not as big a deal. On these public APIs, you must verify everything. They're, think of them as completely open to hackers. It's easy for them to call it. Um, it may be a little difficult for them to get the API key, but they could reverse engineer that client and figure out where it's stored. It is stored in the game client. Okay, so now we're going to come back here and we're going to send the same request again. Okay, so here's strength 99, agility 99 clearly is not going to be equal to 20 and it's going to return this and we get back false invalid input values. And uh, well, I should have had these set to something else to prove that they don't update, but I didn't. So now what we will do is we will come back here and we will change them to something valid. 
let's say that they decided to set this to 12, strength to 12, and agility to 8. So those equal 20. We hit execute. It clearly makes it past it. Hit continue. Clear that breakpoint. Hit continue. And now we got true. No error message. We come back here. And we check and see that it's 12 and 8. So this is looking good. When we test from Swagger, we can use either the HTTP or the HTTPS endpoint. Notice that one of them is at 44340 and the other is at 44341. We're going to conclude part two here. And in part three, we will be adding code to our C++ project in our Unreal Engine game to call this API. And then we'll add a UI where we can have some kind of sliders or something to be able to send those values for strength and agility during the character creation process. If you have any questions, uh, please leave them in the comment sections. And until next time, have a good one.